Congratulations to Jared Isaacman, who is the Trump administration's nominee to be the next NASA administrator. He passed a key hurdle today. He was confirmed by the Senate Commerce Committee. Now it goes to the full Senate for a vote, hopefully in the next few weeks. Months ago, when Jared was first nominated, I knew that he would be you know, confirmed no problem. Like He was widely supported within the space community. There were some questions about ethics and concerns with his relationship with SpaceX and Elon Musk. And then there were some questions about how he would run NASA. I did a whole video on his Senate confirmation hearing. If you missed that, it's well worth a watch. So go ahead and click that link above and you can watch that video next. But I wanna talk specifically about the written testimony that was submitted after the hearing. The senators get the opportunity to ask questions after the fact. And Jared then has an additional space to explain himself. Well, unfortunately, as these things go, he did explain himself more in some areas, and in some areas he acted more like a politician, even though he's not one, but he acted more like a politician in avoiding answering things directly or saying, you know, promising everything, promising the moon and Mars and all the things uh, without having to care whether or not that's realistic in terms of the budget. Just like in the Senate hearing, the main, main topics, the ones that were on most everybody's minds were moon and Mars, the Artemis program, the International Space Station and LEO destinations, commercial space stations, and the question of ethics when it comes to Elon Musk, SpaceX, um, the shift for those kinds of things. There were, of course, plenty of other topics to come up, reduction in workforce, the um, STEM education, different science budgets. These questions came out around the same time that we learned that President Trump is going to recommend a gigantic slash to NASA's science budget. We're looking at like 45 to 50% cut in NASA science throughout, you know, planetary science, astrophysics, heliophysics, etc. That's huge and devastating. It's really Congress that decides where the money is authorized and allocated. I'm going to put the documents down below in the description. There's two of them. Questions from Republicans and questions from Democrats. The Democrat questions are significantly longer than the Republican questions because I believe that Republicans were all already on board with this and no Republican voted against Jared Isaacman. For Isaacman, NASA can pursue Martian objectives. Yes, absolutely. But these should, these should quote, not detract from the near-term objective of returning to the moon first. Given this explicit commitment, I support Mr. Isaacman's confirmation. The final vote tally for this committee was 19 to nine. So nine people voted in favor, nine against. All nine of the against were Democrats. There were some Democrats, four, that voted in favor. Mr. Isaacman seems to be committed to the, uh, the current plan for both lander redundancy, space launch systems, and returning to the, to the moon as fast as possible. I think this is a very big competitive issue for the United States of America. That competitiveness is not just a goal, it's a reality that someday we may wake up and find ourselves falling behind. So today I will support his nomination and hope that we will continue to get leadership out of the administration on uh, clarification of supporting a robust NASA budget. So it was not completely split on party lines, but it was split more on party lines than I thought it would be. Um, I really did think that he'd get a little bit more support from the Democrats. There was some controversy on the Republican side. Um, Ted Cruz, I believe, and, and some others before the committee hearing. Jared Usman had actually donated over the course of years to various Democratic parties and candidates. He did make a huge donation to President Trump right before President Trump won, like $2 million or something like that. So it's definitely not a complete Democrat, it's mixed. What interests me more is the reasons why some of these people might have voted against him. I'm gonna quickly read the list of Democrats who voted one way or the other. Apologies if I mess up some of these names. Senators Klobacher, Schatz, Markey, Peters, Duckworth, Rosen, Lujan, Fetterman, Blunt, Rochester, they all voted against him. Senators Cantwell, Baldwin, Hickenlooper, and Kim all voted for him. And if you remember, actually, there was a exchange between uh, Jared Eisenman and Senator Kim during the hearing that seemed tense, but Kim decided in his favor. Now, Senator Markey, Senator Markey was never going to vote for him. Um, that was the most awkward part of the entire hearing was the exchange between Senator Markey and Jared Isaacman in terms of who was in the room when Jared Isaacman met with President Trump. And, and it was very cringy to use somebody's term. Uh, it was awkward. Um, and that awkwardness continued in the written question and answer where um, 
you know, sometimes these senators think that they can get a straight answer after the fact. And um, fortunately, Jared Eisenman chose not to give a straight answer after the fact. And Jared Eisenman decided he wasn't going to do that. In the written questioning, Senator Markey asked, Question one, was Elon Musk in the room when then president-elect Donald Trump offered you the position of NASA administrator? And then Jared answered, my interview was with the president of the United States, the person asking me questions and ultimately offering me the opportunity was the president himself. And in case that wasn't clear enough, Senator Markey's questions two and three were the same question written differently. And the <laughs> copy and paste answer that Jared gave during the testimony, uh, the oral testimony is the same copy and paste answer he gave here in the written testimony. I actually literally laughed when I read that. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can feel the frustration from Senator Ed Markey <laughs> like through the pages. Um, but generally speaking, the answers that Eric gave to um, they were the questions that some of these senators proposed who voted against him were actually pretty fine to me. Like I didn't catch any real problems, maybe a little bit of evasion. Like I don't know but I will get back to you kind of stuff, like not, not in those words. I don't know, but I will keep it in consideration kind of stuff. Um, so I didn't see anything that was a red flag to any of the answers that he gave to some of the questions that were submitted by the Democrats who voted against him. Not, not all the Democrats submitted questions. Duckworth didn't, Fetterman didn't. I mean, like not all these Democrats even tear, not all these Democrats followed up. I guess what they heard during the hearing was good enough for them to decide that they weren't going to support it or there was politics at work where they were not going to support a nomination of this kind of person on principle for some reason. Now there wasn't a lot said during the Senate hearing today when they, when they did that vote, but there were two people who spoke in favor of Jared Isaacman. Senator Ted Cruz, of course, who is the chair of that committee, and he spoke in favor of Jared Eisenman specifically because Jared supported the whole Artemis architecture of going to the moon as a priority right now, and then in theory, going on to Mars. That is what I said, what I predicted when I made a video a few months ago. You can watch that here. In that video, I talked about how Elon Musk and Donald Trump might want to prioritize going to Mars over the moon, but Congress is going to fight back. Congress is going to say, no, we want to go to the moon first. We want things the way they are right now. And that's exactly how it played out, is how I said, in that Congress is all about status quo, protecting jobs, protecting programs. And we saw this not only with Artemis in the questioning, both oral and written, but also with the International Space Station and commercial LEO destinations program. They wanna make sure that if NASA is giving a whole lot of money to Johnson Space Center, to Kennedy Space Center, to Stennis Space Center, Stennis was specifically a question that was asked about in the written questioning. Like they wanna protect those programs that funding those jobs, et cetera. And therefore they're gonna be a lot less inclined to say, let's cancel Artemis the way it is and just go to Mars without any kind of idea of what that Mars funding would look like and where that would go. I, of course, anticipate that he's going to be voted by the full Senate to become the next NASA administrator, but I do wonder if any other issue is going to pop up that people are going to be questioning or emphasizing because the way that they ask their questions and what questions they repeat and what questions they emphasize and how many members are asking similar questions can tell you where Congress's priorities are. And that can help you predict what's going to happen next. Because right now in the space industry, there is so much uncertainty. People are just in a wait and see mode, in a little bit of a panic mode, or less so now, about what is being canceled or what is being proposed to be canceled or what might be on the docket to be canceled under the Trump administration's budget, which is not out yet. We have only seen rumors and speculation and like draft budgets. We have not yet seen the skinny budget, let alone the full budget proposal. And again, Donald Trump is not the one who gets the final say, that is Congress. So it's really up to Congress which way the funding is going to flow. We have an idea that it's going to flow towards the Department of Defense, you know, Space Force, and that is why you're seeing a lot of emphasis in the space community right now on the Golden Dome and you know, ISR and all these different ways that we can protect our national assets in space and on the ground, of course, using space data. But what's a lot less certain is NASA's, the civil space program, and what's going to happen with the major programs such as Artemis, but also the smaller programs. Reported today by Eric Berger of Ars Technica, he said that NASA's participation in ESA's Rosalind Franklin mission is on the chopping block. Jared Eisenman was asked about the Nancy Grace Roman telescope, which is due to launch in 2027. Um, that was on the chopping block, or could potentially be on the chopping block with the President Trump 
proposal, a budget proposal, and Jared Eisenman supports it. Um, he supported a private mission, Polaris 2, to go service the you know Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, we using private funds, using his own funds. I think there is a disconnect here between Jared's personal interest in space science and personal enthusiasm for space exploration and what the Trump administration is wanting to cut and what Congress is wanting to save because it's in their districts or they just personally have a passion for it. That is why I highly recommend reading over these two documents. They're about 50 pages total and you can see where the priorities lie. One thing that is not such a surprise that Jared Eisenman has been saying during his oral testimony and now his written answers to those questions was his advocacy that we keep SLS, the Space Launch System rocket now for the immediate future. But then we move on to commercial vehicles, commercial heavy lift vehicles. He said that during his testimony, he said it again in writing here in response to Senator questions, the highly expensive, really low cadence SLS does need to transition out and stop competing with the commercial industry that has developed or is in the process of developing heavy lift vehicles that can take its place. Jared Eisenman has been saying this, and that's actually kind of the beautiful thing about that, is that back during the first Trump administration, then NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine said the same thing but kind of said it quietly or he really felt hesitant to speak his mind on this subject because of the political environment that he was in at the time, especially with Senator Shelby of Alabama wielding so much power and being against any kind of cuts to SLS. Now it's a different era. Shelby is no longer Senator and a lot of the commercial alternatives we've got, of course, Starship and we've got New Glenn and we've got Vulcan. And they're either online or in the process of becoming online. Even Boeing knows that something is probably coming up. I don't know when, they don't know when, but two months ago, they did alert their employees that they expect cuts to happen. If you're curious about the future of SLS, then go ahead and watch this video next.